Well, I'll go ahead and get started with this week's uh, session. This is module two. Last week, many of you sat through um, the module one, the DART overview. Uh, and this is the next in the series, customer service. Thursday this week, we'll have flight operations. The following week, we'll do uh, ramp uh, operations. And then we'll end it up with being the DART incident commander, which introduces a lot of subtleties and further complications. Uh, but for tonight we'll, tonight, we'll do customer service. Okay, I have a couple requests. Now that our chatting time is over, go ahead and mute yourself uh, unless you want to talk and maybe jump in and ask a question. Um, if you could type your name and email address in the chat, I'd appreciate it. Um, that way we can be sure to have a record of who attended. Uh, because we may have a large crowd. Um, and at the moment, we can only see four people on the screen that's being recorded. So um, so please type your name in the chat, name and email address. Um, and make sure your screen name is, is correct. Some people you know, share computers with their wife or something. Um, so be sure it's your name on the screen. So tonight, we're going to do a quick overview of customer service. And I want to take just a point right here and uh, give thanks to uh, Marion Harris, who was the author of this um, uh, of most of the slides you're going to see tonight. Marion and Peg Gardner had a year-long um, task force to try to develop our um, training materials for CalDART, because all of our darts around the state need access to good training materials. And they didn't actually finish but they got a load of good stuff created. And so this particular presentation is heavily um, stolen from, uh, not stolen, but borrowed from Marion Harris, who did this particular presentation. So at any rate, we'll do the overview of customer service. We'll go through some flow charts for customer service. Um, there's different functions for customer service. And let me just take a moment to talk about functions. Uh, you know, we do a training like this, you could set it up as a job description, uh, or you could set it up as a functional description. Uh, I chose the functional description because, um, hang on just a second. Okay, somebody letting me know their region just got a power outage. This has been such a vexing thing. But at any rate, so we're going to be talking about customer service as a function. Because uh, however your dart is organized, and there's a million ways to put your dart together, you're going to need somehow to give people service. And we call that function customer service. So, um, so we'll stick with the functional description. We'll go through the forms, talk about how they're filled out. Um, performing sample tasks might be a bit of a stretch, um, but we'll talk about how the forms are used in the tasks. And we'll talk about how customer service interfaces other functional parts of the DART. Who likes stick figures? Marion Harris is a gifted artist. I just fell in love with this the first time I saw it. Um, but basically, we've got the whole gamut of running a DART right here. And it's useful for looking at, well, what's customer service and what's flight ops and what's ramped. So uh, here's a person talking on the phone. If you're going to help a customer, you're going to have to talk to them somehow. It could be on a phone, or maybe uh, if you're in a real emergency, maybe it's on your amateur radio going through a repeater on the mountaintop. Um, or maybe you're doing local service at the airport, and you're letting them walk through the airport gate, and you're helping them right there. Um, so as that person checks in with you, um, you need to make sure, like if they're going to be a passenger, that they've signed their passenger waiver. Um, if they've got boxes of material, you need to weigh it and tag it and bag it um, so that you can safely load an airplane at a later time. Uh, and then you better like go tell your flight service people that, okay, I've got stuff all set up for you to go fly. So this whole first part of the process is what I call the customer service function. Then you get into flight ops where we're scheduling pilots and doing pilot intake, getting into the airplane and flying. Uh, maybe you've got, a, maybe this is the pilot coming into the airport. Uh, at this point, maybe your ramp staff is having piles of stuff that need to go to various airports, San Carlos and Monterey labeled here. We uh, put it all in a cart, 
go out on the ramp and load up a plane. You've got a lineman here that helps them taxi out. And away he flies away. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, uh, you may, we make sure that he gets home. So all of this just to say that Customer service is the front end of this process. Okay, so we're gonna get pretty complicated with a million forms and a lot of details. So let's start at the high level. What, what are we trying to do? The mission is we wanna serve the customer. This is a person who's been through a disaster. Um, they may be homeless. Um, they may not be very organized. Uh, we want to do what they need to help them through from an air transportation point of view to help them through their, their challenge. Um, we do that by processing and creating air transportation service requests. So um, if I have hundreds of people at the gate, I better have uh, records of well who they were, what was their phone number, what was their emergency contact, uh, and all this information we collect in service requests. When we finally got all the information collected, helped them figure out which airport they want to go because they don't know anything about airports. They know more about cities. Um, but we figure out all those details. We hand off a clean package to flight operations, and they take it from there, actually getting the plane that's going to fly them with the adequate payload and that sort of thing. So. I did spend a little bit of time right off the top saying, are we going to treat this from a functional point of view? Or are we going to treat this from a job description point of view? So we're treating it from a functional point of view. Here's where we'd spend just a moment, though, to say, well, who's likely to do customer service operations? Well, it could be a DART incident commander. It could be a customer service manager. It could be customer service staff. It could be an operations section chief. Now, before I spend a lot of time on this, let's go and look at, you know, we can run a DART at a very small level. A DART could be as simple as a DART incident commander with one or more pilots helping him. And in a really small, small operation, the incident commander may be the pilot. So uh, a DART incident commander, in this case, he better be able to deal with the customer and take care of all their functions. Now, in this case, in a level three, that was a level four DART mobilization. Now we're going to a level three, which is a little bit uh, richer staff. Now we have a very nobly labeled customer service manager. Um, and so obviously they need to be able to do customer service functions. But, you know, maybe that person has never done this before. Maybe they're pressed into service at the last minute. Maybe it's a bit of a stretch to call them a manager. So the DART incident commander probably still is going to get pressed into making sure that the job is done right uh, and may need to uh, to do it for the or you know help the customer service manager get it done. If we go to a level two DART mobilization, now we find well we've got a ramp operations manager and they have ramp staff. Hopefully we've got more competence in this person and they can take care of it. But it could be that you've got a really important customer or something really screwy about a particular customer. And on occasion, your DART incident commander probably is still going to get involved in customer service. Excuse me, customer service. Now, here's a level one DART mobilization. This is the one that most closely mirrors the structure of the incident command system. Uh, and by the way, DART in general mirrors the incident command system. The incident command system can also go from a single first responder up to a very, very large responding operation. And it, in a similar way, progresses through by just giving narrower and narrower job definitions as you get more and more people involved. So here's where a lot of people are involved. Now we've got an operations section chief who's a uh, controlling a flight operations manager, a ramp operations manager, and a customer service manager. And the customer service manager has staff and a travel desk. Travel desk is where you help people figure out where they want to go. So um, in this case, uh, it may be that the operations section chief is the one who's troubleshooting issues that bubble up out of customer service. So that's the case where your operations section chief better be, you know, understand what customer service is all about. Hopefully they can contain all the customer service issues to this level so they don't have to drag the DART incident commander into it. Because when you've got an operation this big, 
uh, this guy here is going to be in task saturation, and you want to drive as much of the work out of his uh, lap as you can into these various different uh, groups. So that's a little bit of a description of how customer service, um, how different people in the Dart organization all have to do customer service work. So what kinds of um, background and capabilities, capacities, experience, mm -hmm. um, traits should a DART incident commander and a customer service manager have? Well, one's really easy, know the DART. Um, I hope all of you here have received a DART. Uh, and by the way, please put in the chat if you need to get a copy of the DART. I know in the DART overview training last week, we passed out a bunch, or we emailed after the meeting, a bunch of um, forms, start forms in the manual to different people. But if you didn't get it and you need it, uh, please write that in the chat and we'll get it to you. Um, and by the way, for those of you who came on late, we're also asking you to put your name um, and email address in the chat as well, uh, because that's our only record that we will have that you attended this meeting. So thank you for doing that. Uh, so anyway, you can know the DART. Um, you can take available and applicable training courses, such as this one right here. Um, boy, if you can train people, you know it well. It's one thing to know it well enough to do it yourself. It's a higher level to be able to know it well enough to be able to tell someone else how to do it so that they can understand. Uh, so being able to train staff, very helpful. Um, Good listening skills. Uh, when people have a problem, a lot of times you can't respond to them until you've really listened to what they had to say and you've thought about it carefully to realize what their underlying problem is. And until you understand the underlying problem, you can't help them. So it starts off with good listening skills and good cognitive function. Um, then, Another good trait is that you want to ensure the job is being done right and safely by subordinates. So, you know, nobody likes a person looking over their shoulder all the time. That's no fun. Uh, but you've got to have good communication with your staff to make sure that they are trained and that if they have a question, they come to you uh, and that the proper level of service is being given to everyone in the operation. Um, another helpful thing, and this is one where I'm personally a little bit weak is being flexible to changing needs. You know, we have a pretty nice DART. We've been working on it for a good, I don't know, something like 10 years. But um, it's not perfect. Every time we write it, we find problems with it. Or every time we update it, we find problems and are fixing problems that are there. And it will never be perfect. Uh, and every situation is a little bit different. So a lot of times there's some value in being able to assess the situation and say, well, this part of the DARP works perfect, but you know, we need to develop something um, or we need to, uh, hold me just one second. Pardon me. Okay, so the uh, we have to take into account that um, the DART may not, the DARP, the Disaster Airlift Response Plan, may not really fit the exact problem and challenge at hand, and you may need to develop something for it, or you may need to alter some rule that would otherwise require you to do something in a different way. Um, and finally, another very good uh, characteristic is to have experience. Um, when you're going through the rodeo the first time, it's a lot harder to do it once you've been doing and around exercises for a number of years, you'll have a whole lot quicker ability to jump in and help out and get things done. So now let's dig a little bit deeper into customer service. Um, last week in the uh, overview, we talked about a lot of specific kinds of air transport needs. In this uh, case right here, let's group them into some different types. You have the cargo transport. That's a different kind of an animal than passenger transport. Um, and finally, you can have local observation or reconnaissance flights where you're taking off and landing at the same airport instead of going between two airports as these first two applications do. Um, 
And then in terms of um, who can initiate requests, so they can come in from all over the place. Uh, if you've got a DART at your airport and you're serving your community, well, from your local airport area, you uh, might get a request to do an inbound request like, hey, we need to bring in 20 disaster workers, cadaver dogs and fire people and some medical people from uh, Livermore Airport. Can you go out and pick them up and bring them in? So that's an example of an inbound request. An outbound request might be, my house fell down, I need to go stay with my relatives in Fresno, can you go fly me there? Um, an observation might be the local emergency manager saying, I need to get up in the air and see what's going on with the traffic in our city just so if I can see where there's a route where we can put a bus through. So those are three kinds of local airport operations that you might be asked to do. Um, it could be that uh, other DART operators around the state might be reaching capacity and saturation and might be reaching out to your DART saying, can you help us? Uh, we want you to act as a DART in our area, or we want you to give us as many pilots as you can. Um, so you need to handle that sort of a request. And that, that gets beyond, say, a simple customer service thing, especially if they're just asking you for pilots. Um, but that's the kind of a request that can come into your DART. Uh, and finally, it could be distant persons with any kinds of need. So for instance, my home DART in San Martin is gonna have an exercise in a week and a half. We got a request out of the blue from somebody in Arizona that wanted to participate. Uh, and so for a moment we were saying, well, there are no pilots in Arizona. Maybe we could put something together in Arizona that would be affiliated with our DART exercise. Uh, in the end, we didn't do it, but that's a good example of how even though you're primarily there to help your local airport, you might get a request and you might fill it from someplace a far, but from some person far away. So how do we interface customers? Um, let's look at two basic ways here. So one is that you have a an operation at your airport where you bring the customers, they bring the local community into your airport. And it's much like walking up to any airline's counter at the airport saying, and you walk up and say, help me out. So that's one way, person to person, face to face. And that kind of a case, the, the classic documentation we use is a shipping log uh, and a receiving log where you can take the person's name uh, and their information, put it into the log, um, and they're set. And by the same token, if something comes in from a distant airport, you can put in your log that you received it and away you go. Um, we have found uh, that when we don't do it locally, that when we do it remotely. So what's a remote operation? In Operation Medical Shield, where we did something like 24 COVID operations over a year and a half period, we organized all of that remotely. So it was all organized by email and telephone call, multiple phone calls to arrange an operation um, and in complex requests. Uh, I have a whole bunch of stuff that needs to go to Eugene, Oregon. It's gonna be several thousand pounds, 100,000 um, face masks and a bunch of other stuff too. So we sometimes you end up needing a lot of information to track your specific requests. And this is where our service request form is helpful. It allows for unlimited um, logging of what the customer is requesting. So especially for the more complicated requests, it's a great way to record what it is they ask for to make sure you're giving them what they need. And that way, when you hand it off to flight operations, Flight operations doesn't have to talk to you. They just look at your very detailed notes that you put in the service request form and they can see exactly what that customer needs and they can take it from there. Uh, so that sort of remote uh, operation has both a service request form as well as a service request uh, log. And so the log is a handy thing. It summarizes all the service requests that have come in uh, very easily. You can go find a particular service request, whereas the forms get pretty long and pretty deep and it's hard to find a given request. And of course, all of this assumes that we're dealing with 
paper forms or perhaps Google forms in a, in a Google Drive environment where we don't have a really slick database that does automated searching and that sort of thing for us. So a little bit deeper dive into um, tasks that are completed uh, as we go through these different forms and these different uh, applications. I mentioned we have an outbound cargo case. Well, in that case, we want to weigh, bag, and tag. So the people bring us stuff, we put it on a scale, we tag it, uh, mark it, bag it if need be, if it's not already in a good box, um, and record how much it weighs. And this allows people in flight operations to start filling up a plane with different boxes and get the maximum use out of that plane that they can. Now, in the case that we're dealing with cargo, it's also customer services job, if need be, to set up secure inventory storage. So when people give you $50,000 worth of narcotic medical supplies, uh, those could be pilfered and they're really attractive to people to walk away with. You wanna be sure to have some kind of secure storage that you can take care and properly uh, safeguard that uh, product until it's out of your hands and in the hands of the end user. Um, so that's cargo outbound. Let's look at cargo inbound. So a similar thing there. Um, I could have receiving. Um, I don't really have to log how much it weighs because I don't care how much it weighs. It's already been air transported. But I do want to note where it came from, what it was, who it's going to, um, and storing it and marking it so that I can then release it when the party shows up to pick it up. So now let's look at passenger for outbound flights. And, and by the way, let me just pause right here for a second. Um, it could be that you have a question. And if we get all the way to the end of this presentation before you get a question answered, uh, it may be really hard to even remember what your question was. So let me just invite all of you, if you have a question, unmute yourself and jump in uh, on an audio basis. Uh, and ask the question, okay? So I'm gonna pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Hey, uh, Paul, this is Diane. Yeah, yeah, I do have one question. Uh, going back to almost to the beginning, I'm assuming that the larger or more complex the disaster is, the higher level of organization we'd use. Yeah, more people, through, yeah. and we're going to be getting people from all around the state, hopefully, to help people out because uh, it's it's hard for a single airport to put up a fifty person or a hundred person dark ground crew that knows what they're doing uh, to manage an incident. Okay, thank you. And Phil, you had a question. Yeah, I just want to put it out to everybody. You know, you've got a tight timeline, and you've got you really got this put together well. So rather than trying to interrupt you. I just wanted to tell everybody, if you're on a computer at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions um, a button. And if you click on that, you can raise your hand like you see on my, and then there's also a lower hand button. So that'll let Paul know that you have a question. Ah, uh, that is a more uniform way to handle it and avoids the situation where 20 people are all trying to talk at once. Thank you for pointing that out, Phil. Yes, let's use that raise hand function. I'll look at my sideways at my screen from time to time and pick up those hands. Okay, so we have a hand up for Dale. Go ahead, Dale. And Dale, I can't hear a word you're saying. Right now you're muted, so if you press that mute button one more time, you'll be unmuted. Well, he's trying to figure that out, Paul. The other way to uh, unmute yourself is if you all just press the space bar on your computer and hold it down, that'll also um, uh, unmute you. Okay, thank you, Phil. Uh, and one thing that I can do, like uh, Dale's having trouble. Dale, if you can put your um, question in the chat. Uh, Phil, if you can raise your hand when you see it and uh, ask it for him, I'd appreciate it, okay? Very good. So coming back to uh, any more questions besides Dale. Dale, you can put your hand down now. Uh, okay, I see no more additional questions. So going on with passenger outbound flights. 
so um, here's a good point. This fitness for flight, CalDART, uh, the DART section 2.05 medical considerations. Um, when people get in planes, they could have medical things going on with them that could make it unsafe for them to go high up in the air at 8,000 feet or 10,000 feet for transportation. Most of our planes are not pressurized. So if you get a really hairy uh, incident, it's good to have a doctor available uh, for you. And if you don't have a doctor or a nurse available, there are at least some questions that are pointed out in that section 2.05 that you can screen anybody that's gonna fly and help figure out if they've got an issue where maybe uh, it needs to be dealt with before they get into a plane. Um, so what else do we do for passenger outbound flights? Well, that's when we have to collect passenger waiver forms. So the passenger has to sign that they're willing uh, to fly and they absolve CalDART of all the risks and that form has to be witnessed. Uh, we fell out a passenger ticket uh, so that passenger can be waiting with their little ticket that says they get to fly. Flight operations will have to come up and tell them what their flight number is going to be, uh, but at least they have a ticket that identifies them and shows everybody that they're in the system. Um, and of course, we have templates for all of these things in the uh, in the DART uh, and in the forms folder that's on the DART leaders resources folder on the Google Drive. So we also have passenger for inbound flights. Uh, yes, we have a question. Zach, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Okay. Um, Paul, is there a prioritization process for outbound flights and, and who determines that priority? In other words, if we have a limited number of pilots, a limited number of planes, uh, and, and more calls for service, how do we prioritize outbound stuff? Well, that's for the uh, the DART to figure out, um, you know, what are the most important uh, um, priorities. So certainly saving a life is the most important thing. Saving property is important. Um, after that, it becomes a judgment call. Whose need is more important than who else's need? Mm -hmm. um, you may have operational allegiances, like in general, emergency services calls the shots. So if emergency service is telling you that an operation is very high priority uh, and they're with the city or the county, uh, you know, that jumps up very high in your priority list. Um, if you've got a bunch of um, um, pilots, you may be able to satisfy multiple competing priorities at the same time. But you're muted, Zach. Go ahead. Zach, you're muted. Zach, unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, sorry. So there's not a written prioritization process. It's more of a we'll determine that as as the as the emergencies develop, as the priorities present themselves. Yeah. So that's where a customer service manager comes in and a DART incident commander come in. Uh, that's where you would look for your prioritization to be focused. Yeah. Okay. And, and if you got a small team, then you get the team together and you hash out what seems to be the most important thing. Thank you, Zach. And you can put your hand down if that did it. Okay, so then we have um, passengers for inbound flights. So we want to log that they came into our operation um, and we want to um, actually flight operations. This shouldn't be in customer service. Flight operations would be um, communicating with flight operations on the other side saying their flight came in and was delivered successfully. Um, and finally, uh, optional. I mentioned Travel Desk a couple times. Um, there is a fabulous map of California put out by the Caltrans Division of Aeronautics. It's about four or five feet tall. It's got every single public airport in the state and the entire state on a single page. So it's, um, and it's a wonderful way if you can put it under glass and have it available at your airport during a, a, a mobilization. The public can walk up to that. They can point on the state where they need to go. I need to go to Fresno, Bakersfield. So it's a map that combines both the cities and the airports, and it's a wonderful way to figure out where you want to fly. So that's you know having a travel desk. It's like a travel agent because people don't know how to use uh, general aviation small planes. They don't know where they can fly to. So you really have to help help them with that whole uh, process of figuring out where they want to go. 
So the last thing is to make a clean handoff to flight operations. Uh, so when you've worked it and worked it and worked it and figured everything out, got it fully documented, go ahead and hand it off to flight operations and let them uh, let them take it from there. So they'll get back to the passenger with what flight they're actually gonna go on and they'll introduce the pilot to the passenger. Next, we can think a little bit about layout. I'll come back and look at this layout from time to time. There's a million and one ways to lay out an organization. So this is, there's nothing magic about this one particular one. One thing I will note though that I kind of like is that you have an entrance for the public to come in and customer service is the first thing they come to. And that's really logical. You know, people that walk in the door, um, let them see the people that can help them first off. And then customer service can point them out how the rest of the process works after that. So I mentioned earlier that we have two common ways to set up customer service. One way is that you should be on the airport in person. The other way is that you could uh, be working remotely. So um, a little bit more about the paperwork now and the on-site uh, condition. So you've got a folder for collecting all the passenger waivers. You've got a whole stack of blank waivers so that people that just walk up can sign it and fill it out and be logged into the system. And you've got another folder for completed passenger waivers. These are the records you'll want to keep for several years. Heaven forbid that we may be in court someday and we may need these records of what happened. So, um, so that's why we want to do a good job of keeping the paper records. Um, next up for the shipping, uh, that binder, the shipping and receiving log, we'll want to have a binder full of empty sheets that we can just log stuff in as it comes. Um, we could have the same uh, or additional binder, depending on how much volume you think you're going to have. If you're going to do a lot of service, then you get different binders for each of these forms. Uh, but you could have a binder for all your service request forms, so they're stored neatly and you can dig through them and find the ones you want. Um, you can get a carbonless paper to create a copy of either the shipping log entry or the service request form for sharing with flight operations. Now, let me talk about this a moment. When you're operating in customer service, people are coming through that door continuously. Um, every time you service one of them, that's an opportunity for customer service, excuse me, for flight operations to go give that person a flight. So how do you communicate that information to customer service when you're tied down with this whole line of people that are coming in registering with you? So every time you enter that service request form uh, or every time you enter the service request log, you put a carbon under it, you have a duplicate paper that you're creating. When that paper is complete, you can cut that duplicate out and send a shuttle over to flight ops. So now they can start working on it, start assigning a pilot to that particular piece of work, that, that particular uh, customer that needs to be flown or the baggage that needs to be flown. Another way you can handle it, instead of doing carbonless paper, hey, why not use your cell phone, take a picture of it, and send a text message to your buddy in flight ops. And now he's got the same document. It's kind of hard for him to store it, so you still have an issue of, well, how do I eventually print these out and store them? But you've at least accomplished immediate delivery uh, so they can get to work on it. Um, now you want to have a variety of, of um, supplies available as well. Uh, so labels, like if I'm going to bag, tag, and weigh something, a cargo box, I got to have a label to stick on those cardboard boxes. I have a whole roll of material identification labels that I can stick onto each box and uh, put all the appropriate information for that box. Um, tape is good because I may have to tape up these boxes. Um, garbage bags are helpful if you have to bag anything extra cardboard boxes to box things up if you need to do that, that can be helpful as well. The other thing that's useful is signage. Um, you know, it's nice to have a banner up that says customer service. So people walk through the gate, they see a customer service sign, they can walk up and know that that's where they can, they can get some help. Uh, and by the same token, you can 
mark other areas in your operation as well, such as shipping, receiving, flight operations, that sort of thing. So while that was on-site airport operation, I don't see any hands up, so I'll continue. Um, now we get into remote operation. So I mentioned that uh, quite a few of the uh, Operation Medical Shield, all of the Operation Medical Shield was organized remotely. So in that case, we have an online service request log. Uh, and that records uh, line by line by line, one line for each service request that comes in. It's backed up by the service request forms um, and a binder for hard copy storage long term. Sometimes our computer records don't last all that long, so it's good to have a hard copy backup. Um, now we want to have some form of working communication to send the request to your flight ops group. So if you work in a Google Documents environment, you can tell the flight ops people just to go into the customer service folder and look at the service request log, and they can dig up the service request form for that particular customer and find all the information they need. Um, so that's one good way of doing it. Now, you may need to email them or text them that, hey, just finish this one, go look at it. Uh, and that way they know um, that they should, they're prompted to go uh, give them immediate service and you won't have any delay. And of course, when flight ops is ready, they should give you feedback on your jobs as they complete so that you can mark them out as complete in your records. So that's customer service setup. Let's look a little bit deeper about remote service requests. Um, so how do you receive it? Um, it could be if you're CalDART, you've got a uh, duty uh, phone line where people can call the phone number advertised on the website and talk to somebody that can help them with their need. Uh, if it's your own DART activated in an emergency, you've probably published through your local radio station and through other uh, social media um, what, how you can be contacted. Do you have an email address? Do you have a phone number to call? Is it text messaging? Uh, so that's how people can contact you. When they contact you, you collect their information and fill out a service request form. The service request forms can be kind of technical. It might be hard for the customer to fill it out themselves. You can help out by talking to them on the phone and filling it out over the phone, uh, or by just asking them some simple questions that they can answer uh, and give you the information that you can then put into the form for them. Um, nice thing about a online electronic system on a database, uh, shared working environments such as Google Documents, is it's very easy to uh, update those service request forms as customers ask you to make additional uh, details for them. They, they give you additional details about what they're asking for. Uh, and every time you update that form, if you've already handed it off to flight operations, you need to update them on the change. Okay, so um, I think that covers it. Any any questions on this slide before we move on? Okay, so now let's look at this outbound passenger operation. Um, you recall these are the same stick figures from that very first uh, page we looked at. But step one is the passenger arrives and goes through your entry door, whatever that is. Uh, in this case, they put a greeting person there that gives them the waiver right off the bat that they can sign. Um, hopefully you've got a scale there, they can weigh themselves or they can just give you their weight. And by the way, it can be very traumatic for people to be weighed. Um, so you don't necessarily want to weigh them. Uh, and if you give, if they give you a weight and you think it's wrong, just put in the higher weight and don't necessarily tell them what weight you're putting in. Uh, you know, we want to be safe for our pilots. We don't want to overload them. But I, I have really seen people, especially like if they're a little overweight and they're self-conscious about their weight and maybe they're worried about, oh my God, how can I fit into a little plane? I'm too heavy. 
uh, if you ask them to step on a scale, they can just flip out and, and be very unhappy. So uh, certainly we want to have happy people. We don't want to cause anybody any trauma. Um, just be sure you operate safely. So at any rate, so that's passengers and providing weight. Uh, we talked about the medical screening that's in section 2.05 of the DART. Um, and then we fill out the comment there with regard to weight. Uh, in those cases of sensitivity, I, I imagine it'd be a good idea to suggest maybe you'd like to write it down instead of saying it out loud. Yep, it's absolutely. Medical screening. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody has a broken arm, there's nothing sensitive about that. But uh, there may be other uh, medical things that somebody would prefer to write it down instead of saying it because there's people nearby. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Paul, this is Diane. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. Let me finish first. I have a question. Why do we do a medical screening when passengers don't even have to do that when they get on an airline? What are we looking for? Well, assuming we've just been through a disaster, um, some of the people that need to get out are going to be injured. Okay. Uh, and they, they may have medical issues going on with them that you wouldn't normally get at an airline counter. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And none of us are doctors. Very few of us are anyway. Fewer, few of us are um, uh, nurses. So um, this section 2.05, it was written by a medical doctor who was our uh, chief medical doctor for CalDART for a couple of years. Uh, and it's a good uh, guide for the layman on things you can look for as a non-trained person that maybe you should indicate whether we should get further help from medical people. Phil Vardar, go ahead. Yeah, I'm a nurse. So just to answer Diane's question, if somebody's a diabetic and they're under stress, you know, they may have forgotten to take their insulin or their morning meds. They may, uh, their blood sugar may shoot up. So some of the very basics, you know, if they have a serious heart condition, I can see it'd be good information to have just in case you have to divert. Thank you, Phil. Gary, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to pile on with that. We had a recent situation up here in the Sierras where they had scuba divers helping out and they might need to get transported somewhere else. And, if, you know, if they were down below, what is it, 30 feet, they can't fly for 24 hours. Um, might be just one, one more reason to say, is there any reason you shouldn't fly and then open up the conversation a little bit? Very good. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Um, and thank you all for piping up with questions and comments because that really does add a lot of value to this video as something we might use in the future uh, for people to pull down and listen about how to do customer service. That extra experience that big people bring to the table really adds a lot of value. Okay, so um, updating, where were we on this? That was two, the end of two, let's go to three. So the next thing we do is fill out a service request form and log. Passenger ticket. Um, that service request form, of course, is optional if you're in local uh, local operation. You might be able to get by without using it, just using the shipping log, but it's there if you need it. Um, and they give them a passenger ticket and direct them direct the passenger to a waiting area where, uh, while flight operations is trying to get them a flight, uh, they'll sit there and hold. Um, so next step. Um, we'll bring the service request form to flight operations, or it could be the shipping log entry. Um, a person that's a passenger on an outbound flight, that's analogous to shipping. So um, we send that information to flight operations. Then we, um, if the passenger comes back to us and gives us any additional changes or from what they initially told us, uh, then we record that information and send it off to flight operations so they've got the latest and greatest. So now let's look at a uh, local operation for outbound cargo. So instead of shipping passengers out, now we're shipping boxes or other kinds of cargo. So one thing we'll want to do is add a screening for hazmat. Um, Bob Goodwin, are you on the call? I think you're on the call. If you can unmute and give us a quick 30 or second or 60 second pitch on what hazmat is, we'd all appreciate it a lot. Okay, hazmat. 
um, is, are things that are poisonous or toxic or flammable. And uh, we had a brief discussion on this a couple of years ago. And the short answer for uh, Caldar is officially we do not carry. So anything that's flammable or combustible or explosive, if it has that label on it, you uh, are, as far as we're concerned, not permitted to carry it. Uh, it, it, it would become a major operation to create a hazmat manual like an airline has, tell you what things you can carry. And I'm sure there are some things you would be tempted to carry uh, that look innocuous, innocuous to you. Uh, that would be a case of don't ask, don't tell. If we know about it and it's hazmat, you really should not carry it. Okay, thanks, Bob. That was well stated. So step one, screen for hazmat when those uh, when the cargo arrives on site. Step two, weigh the cargo, fill out the service request form, shipping uh, and or I should say shipping receiving log. Affix the material identification label. See, we've got one right here. Going to San Carlos, 600 pounds. Hazmat nut. What does that say? Of course, we're not shipping hazmat. Um, way bag and tag. There's a little bag that we had sticking around our, our uh, long garden bag. Um, now, if it's a, we'll just leave the stick person out of it for the moment. So all of our stuff now that's in the baggage area to be shipped, the, the inventory storage area has been uh, tagged and it's ready to be put on a plane. So it's securely stored. Um, and then we're taking the completed information over to flight operations so that they can arrange the pilot uh, to put it into the plane. Okay, any questions? Okay, oh, Phil, go ahead. Uh, Dale was asking if there's a weapons policy and that's actually a great question. I don't think we've developed one yet. Um, certainly the pilot has to be comfortable uh, with whatever is going in his plane. Um, and Bob, jump in if you've already handled that one before, but I don't think we've we've handled the issue of what do you do with weapons on the plane. I think that might be something we want to consider, especially with the number of people that are trying to use concealed carry. I think, you know, that wouldn't occur to a lot of people. I think that would be a, a good part of the screening. Okay, so um, if I I understand you're, say, you're saying, what I hope you're saying is we find out if people are carrying uh, firearms and tell them not to, because that's really all we can do here. Um, we're, uh, items that are in question, like guns and ammo. Uh, well, the gun without any ammo might not be as bad, but uh, the all we can say officially is if in doubt, don't. Uh, we are not in a position to say uh, that we can take something that, that's hazardous, like a weapon. Uh, if if the if it happens to go to the pilot and the pilot sees it and the pilot's okay with it, that's entirely on the pilot. But as far as Caldart is concerned, any hazmat, any any ammunition is not going. Certainly, I would think there shouldn't be a need for. Um a loaded weapon in a plane. Any weapon that were in my plane, for instance, I would want to make sure the weapon was unloaded. Um, but think that we may be asked to carry um, police uh, people or perhaps uh, uh, people from our armed forces into an area, National Guard, uh, they're going to be armed people. So hopefully we could carry their weapons as well. Um, great question though. Yeah, well, in that case, I would, that's again, these iffy questions are falling on the PIC. And so uh, you know, if he's pretty sure he won't get in trouble after the fact, if someone's a, a true uniformed police officer, he's probably okay to do it. Um, but he, it's up to him and not to Caldart. Yeah, okay. Good enough. So any other questions before we move on? Okay. I'm going to do a little sideline here on C pods, commodity points of distribution. Um, it's, you know, we talk about the DART and what goes on on the ramp or the airport in a local operation. 
um, we want to be able to scale up to very large numbers. So we've talked about having a large number of people in the dark. One of your issues that arises when you go into high volume operation is how do we get the public through in a high volume way? So for instance, let's say there's a huge earthquake somewhere and we are tasked with bringing in water and food uh, on a major way. And it could be that a very easy way to and an efficient way to set that up for the community is that we bring the water and food into the airport. Uh, we create a commodity point of distribution where the water and the food will be given away. And we basically set up a glorified drive-through operation where the public drives up in their cars. Maybe we give them two or three or four lanes um, where they get to momentarily stop, open their trunk, we fill their trunk with water and food, and boom, they're on their way and the next car drives up. So in that way, you can get to a fairly high volume of operation. We don't have any information in our DARP that says how to run a CPOD. You can get some good information from the California Emergency Services Association on how to manage CPODs, and it's there are other sources that, that write about that. But I think you can ask your CERT people, you can ask your local emergency managers, if you do partner with them in a very large operation uh, at an airport, ask them to put together and staff a CPOD as a part of the overall operation and do it on the parking lot. A lot of airports have a big parking lot where you could set up a lot of different drive-through lanes for people to get service. Um, Jim Gates, you have a question, go ahead. And Jim, if you're talking, you need to go off mute in order to ask your question. Is that better? Yeah, much better. Sorry. Uh, it, it seems like the, the point of distribution setup would be something that would be handled by the local emergency management people rather than the DART. You know, we're, we're more the transportation arm of all that activity. And I'm not sure whether we want to get into the, the pod activity. Sure. Um, and I, I think you're agreeing with me. Um, so ask the emergency manager to set it up for you and I'll have them consider it because it may be something from an overall operational point of view, it may be the right way to go. Uh, it, takes a, it takes people and it takes a little bit of experience to staff a CPOD um, so that, you know, putting it on their shoulders is that one way to handle it. Yeah, that okay. IS-26 course is a, a really good one to go through and, and see how that's done. Say again? Say the IS-26 course of FEMA is a really good way to go through and understand how that's set up and how their standards are, are uh, laid out. Good. And I forget, is IS-26 a CPOD course? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So I'm thank you for... Right now. Mm-hmm. And I think we have that on our list of, uh, of courses to take um, as part of background information if you want to broaden your value to the overall DART operation and, and make your DART a better DART. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is on CPODs. Um, Philip, so I guess we're going to have a lot of action items out of this chat. Good enough. Keep in mind, we'll read that chat and take care of people's requests after the meeting. Um, next item. Okay, local operation for inbound passengers and cargo. Um, so we bring them into the customer service manager from the ramp. We get some help from our ramp staff to bring them in. There's our line person bringing the plane into parking. Um, Maybe this gateway is the gateway from the ramp into the operations area for the DART. Uh, you could have a similar gateway to go from the operations area out into the parking lot where people park with their cars. So whether you're coming in from the ramp where the planes are or from the parking lot where the cars are, both of those would be entrances into the DART operations area. Um, so we fill out the log to show that we received the inbound passenger or cargo. And then we transfer it to holding for pickup, whoever's gonna pick it up. And by the way, let me just throw in right here, 
but a lot of our operations are what I would call single-ended darts. We have a dart on one end of the operation, but we don't have anything at all on the other end. And so if I'm really transferring something from, say, San Martin, my home airport, to San Carlos, um, I may not have a dart working there. So rather than getting checked in by a dart, um, flight operations and customer service would have had to arrange, well, who's going to be at the airport to pick it up? Is there an FEO where it could be dropped off and, and kept until the person picks it up? Or do we have to do a person-to-person -person handoff with making a cell phone call when we get to the airport? Those are the kind of details that are the fine points of making sure that each flight operation is going to be a success. So process well, flow. I'm, I'm sorry, yes, sir. I have a question about that. Sorry, I'm a little slow on getting unmuted. Um, if we have an inbound passenger who's injured, do we make arrangements for transportation to a hospital or is there another organization that takes care of that? Good point. So let's just jump off into the, you know, how do we handle really sick people kind of a discussion. Um, if you have a sick person coming in, that would be a wonderful thing. If you could make um, arrangements for transport from the airport to the local hospital, you know, that, that's the gold standard. Uh, I have seen that done in an operation where we partnered with an emergency service group out of the city and they picked us up at the airport and put us in their all-terrain vehicle that could go over any urban mess and delivered us to the hospital. And total elapsed time from beginning of transport to walking into the emergency room door was right around three hours. Um, we did that for a couple different hospitals. Um, they talk about a golden hour for air transport. Uh, so we're not hitting that golden hour. That was three hours. Uh, we also have practical issues that our planes are pretty crappy ambulances. They don't have uh, uh, medical supplies. They don't really aren't well equipped for stretchers. If we can put somebody on a stretcher, maybe they aren't going to be properly um, belted in in case there's an accident. Um, maybe there's not room for a nurse to be sitting by that person to give the person medical attention as they're under transport. So there's a whole lot of reasons why we don't do medical transport per se. But that said, we're just like cars. Uh, and sometimes a car is the best way to get a person to the hospital, even if they're grievously injured. Uh, a good example of that was in Denver. Um, they had a mass shooting at a movie theater. Uh, something like 20 people all gunned down at the same time. Um, and they just threw those people into cars and drove them straight to the hospital and didn't try to wait for ambulances to come and show up. You could conceivably have something similar to that uh, with flying. And, you know, heaven help us that if that should happen, that we get some doctors and nurses working with us at the airport to handle, you know, as many medical items as should be handled before a person gets in a plane to be flown. Uh, did that answer your question, Diane? I had to unmute again. Yes, thank you very much. That was great. Okay, good enough. So back to uh, process considerations here. Um, so we've seen these process uh, figures, people coming in, whether they be passengers or cargo, being processed through customer service, and on they go to flight operations after the paperwork is filled out and the paperwork is passed to flight operations. And the reverse process, we're coming in directly off the ramp, um, we get logged in at customer service and then they go out to the, uh, the parking lot and drive away. Okay, so a little bit about the documents. Now we're gonna get into the actual documents. I've been referring to these documents time and again. Now we're gonna take a look at them. So here's the shipping and receiving log. I marked down a date that I'm dealing with. I put a, a number, the number could start at one and it goes one, two, three. I put an S or an R before that number. An S if I'm shipping it out on a plane to someplace else. An R if it came in off the plane and we're gonna deliver it locally to somebody. Um, if it's cargo, I put the from name and organization address and telephone number. If it's a passenger, I put their name and cell phone number. I also put an emergency contact name and an emergency contact cell phone number. Um, and then 
So this information we had from, we do two, where is it going to? Number of pieces, if it's cargo, it may be that every separate box is separately labeled and you only have one piece per box, but it could be that you've got, you know, a group of five things that all have to be shipped together. So it might be one of five, two of five, three of five, four of five, that sort of thing. If it's passengers, you talk number of people, you talk the total weight, and record the total weight. And later when flight operations assigns the pilot, they put in the flight number. And when it's been uh, received, we mark who uh, signed out for it. So let's say, um, let's say I've received some cargo, it came out of a plane, now I'm holding this cargo for somebody to pick it up at the airport. Uh, when they take that cargo, I get them to print their name and I get them to write their signature and the date that they received it. And that's my record of who I handed it off to. Okay, any questions on the shipping receiving log? And of course, there's full instructions for these things on the form. And here's your shipping receiving instructions. Basically the same thing I told you, but if you don't have access to this video, you could get basically the same story from the instructions. I've mentioned a service request log. I've mentioned that the service request log is nice because I could have a whole bunch of service requests and I have them all on a single page. So it's not too hard to find a particular person in service request. Now, this organization right here should really say organization and name. That's the, when we do the next revision of this thing, that's gonna be a change that's gonna be made. Because a lot of time you don't really know who the organization is, but you know the person's name. Or if you're trying to find somebody in a passenger waiting area, you don't care that they're with uh, Orchard Supply Hardware, you compare that it's Joe Smith. So you want really both of those pieces of information. The organization, if there is one, and the name. Then you have departure, city-state, airport ID, um, arrival, city-state, airport ID, the weight of the uh, total weight of the request, uh, number of passengers, if there's passengers, request a departure date and time, and is it past the flight ops? Now, this is a key thing, because if you've got flight ops sharing a Google Drive, uh, Google Sheet with customer service, because customer service can start out writing no on this, N for no, meaning they're still collecting information that's not ready to go yet. Once they've got it ready to go. Now you can say, yes, pass it to Flight Ops. So I've sent my email to Flight Ops. When they come back in here and look at it, they'll get a confirmation. It's got a yes that, okay, it's ready for Flight Ops to, to take this information and run with it. Um, and then Flight Ops will assign a flight number, um, then a date that that flight is completed, and uh, who entered all this information. Okay, any questions? Okay, next step. So here's the service request form. So I mentioned that the service request form, number one, number two, number three, number four, this is where you get all the detail information. And note all the notes down here at the bottom, you can write to your heart's content. This is where we can really nail down exactly what is needed. How many passengers there are, what does each passenger weigh? A lot of times a pilot, they can take a light person in the back row. They can't take a heavy person in the back row. So it's important for them to know how much each person weighs. Um, you've got emergency contacts and emergency cell phone numbers, as well as passengers name and cell phone number and email address. We've got uh, organizations, cell phone, departure city, state. So it could be that the person arranging the transport is not the same person as who's being flown. So here you can write the person that's arranging it, and that could be separate than the person who's actually flying or the people who are flying, which could be important because this person here is where you're getting your details from, but these people down here are who are actually going to show up at the airport. And likewise, down here, uh, if it's cargo, you can detail out all the cargo, dimensions, quantity, weight, that sort of thing. Any questions on the service request form? Nope. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, by cargo, does that include somebody's, you know, a woman's purse or a backpack? Uh, no. Typically, um, the person's weight 
uh, will be their weight plus any hand stuff they're carrying. And if it's more than a lunch pail and more than a purse, then you might ask them to detail, you know, declare it as a separate bag and, and give it an approximate volume. So passengers could be carrying suitcases and they could be quite difficult uh, to store uh, and they could take up cargo area that might be quite limited. Good question. Okay. Okay, so now we have a cargo identification label. Earlier we were saying, weigh it, bag it, tag it. So here's your tag. Uh, this number here ties out to the service request or the shipping receiving log number. So um, this is important because uh, we got to know what underlying documentation backs up this particular box. We have a brief description of what's inside. We have the from and the to information. So if the box gets lost, at least we know where it goes. Uh, if there's a multiple piece shipment, this is where we write down box one of five or how many we've got. We mark down what flight number it's going on and what its weight is. And here, um, these are the instructions. They're overwritten, uh, so you can't read them all, but they're included with the form. So if you totally forget this a year from now when you actually do your exercise, the, the instructions, detailed instructions are included with each form. A comment uh, there, I would think that on the from box, you should include the airport so that you know people at the other airport wonder, where did this thing come from? Good point. It doesn't say, does it? That would be good to know, certainly. Certainly at our airport, when we're shipping it and bagging it, we know that it's going to come from our airport. But on the other side, they may not know which airport it came from. Good point. Send that to me in an email, Wayne, and we'll note it for the next edition. OK, passenger ticket. So. Um, this is a pretty corny looking passenger ticket. It's basically just a modified uh, baggage tag, but it allows you to put the person's name and their organization, if there is one, tie it back to a service request number, which could be a shipping log number um, and a flight number, which of course is provided by flight operations and which airport they're going to. Now, uh, customer service can give the passenger their ticket but at that point, they're not gonna know the, the flight number. So when flight operations has finished doing the job and they introduce the pilot to the passenger, that's the point where flight operations can write down what the flight number is on that ticket. Okay. Um, and now one kind of a nearly closing thought. Um, you know, we have a very detailed DARP disaster airlift response plan. There's a statement in there that says the DART incident commander has the authority to change anything whatsoever in the manual to meet the needs of a given uh, response. And here's an example of where a major change was made. For the Oregon firefighter airlift, where we had 23 planes involved, we transported 4,800 pounds of cargo. We had hub airport at Santa Rosa where people that could only fly halfway were handing their loads off at Santa Rosa and they were getting offloaded and stored in inventory and then getting reloaded in a totally different way and different planes that were continuing on. And that whole scenario, we didn't even bother having customer service because there was only one customer, it was direct relief. Uh, and there had been a, a million emails going back and forth and they were bringing all the goods to the airport in their own truck and basically bringing them right out onto the ramp. So we totally bypassed the customer service function that day. We didn't document it. And instead, we documented everything that we put onto the aircraft with aircraft load sheets. And we would have had those anyway. And the aircraft load sheets is what we presented uh, direct relief as evidence that we had shipped everything they gave us. So, um, so that's an example of being flexible and doing things a little bit differently according to the needs of a specific incident. By not having customer service, we saved an enormous amount of paperwork uh, and a lot of a lot of uh, labor that didn't need to be expended. And that's the end of the presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Bob here. Uh, not a question.
question, but I want to clarify what I uh, mumbled about regarding hazmat. Uh, because I used the phrase, don't ask, don't, don't tell, and that might be confusing to some people. So first off, if something has that diamond hazmat label, we reject it. We don't take it if it's official hazmat. Secondly, if it does not have the, the diamond label, but you're still, you know it's hazmat, it's some flammable hand sanitizer or some liquid battery, again, we reject it. We don't take it. And then after that, you're pretty sure something's safe. What is it? cologne or whatever, um, or a small battery, you, you think it's probably safe to okay, it's not officially labeled hazmat. In that case, you fully communicate any concerns you might have to the pilot in command. You let it, it, it be his decision whether to carry it or not. Uh, but if, if you are not satisfied that it's safe, then Caldart does not accept hazmat. Thank you. And by the way, let me introduce Bob. Most of you probably know that he's an airline transport pilot. He had many years working on the line. We are lucky to have him as our vice president of, I think it's called Methods, Procedures, and Certification, if I remember right. So uh, Bob has dealt with a number of thorny issues for us and is a subject matter expert in a number of areas. Thank you, Bob. Yes, uh, Gary. Oh, that was a thumbs up. I got it. 